Um, and also, also um, <clears throat> Jason Rohde, my colleague, is also uh, going to be helping me today with this presentation. I've never used the WIMBA um, classroom myself, uh, so although I have participated before. Um, but um, Jason will be kind of monitoring the uh, dialogue that goes on as you type information. But right now what you see in front of you is the WIMBA classroom interface. And the white area that um, holds the information that you're looking at uh, is kind of like the, the screen that we'll be working with. That's where the presentation and the content will actually be displayed. Um, and then we have the, uh, I have a, the presenter's console, um, which you don't really see, but that would be off on the right-hand side if you were actually the facilitator of a workshop or of a class. And the blue area that you see right here um, is toward the bottom left, and that's where you see the actual words that you're typing. And then as I think everybody has gotten the hang of it now, the little narrow window next to that down arrow is where you actually enter text. Uh, as what you will enter when you're actually responding to questions or um, um, putting together some sort of dialogue. Uh, the participant frame uh, is to the left of my image. Uh, this will list all of the participants who are part of the workshop, and it will um, just list the number of people, and then there's an archiver there, uh, but all the names of the people, and those are the names that will actually show up also in the text area, or the uh, chat area. Uh, the branding frame is where my image is. This is where you can put any kind of a logo or, or something that might be related to the class that you're teaching. And then the um, uh, kind of a beige band uh, is the location of where we have the audio and the video options, and that's where the talk button is. And um, you can probably see a little bar graph that goes up and down as I speak. So what I'd like you to do right now is deselect your name, uh, your little check marks that you put by your name. There we go. That looks good. Okay. A couple more people. If you deselect, and that's great. All right. The general guidelines then. If you would like to ask a question, either through the microphone or via the text chat, I'd like you to raise your hand. <clears throat> Pardon me. And the way you do that is if you look again where you put the check mark, there's a little hand. So if you see that little hand area, if you all right now would just practice, um, just click the area where your hand icon is to your name. Okay, notice then as you were checking that box, the um, software is recording the order in which you actually raised your hand. So if I had some dialogue going on and I wanted to um, discuss with the, the participants um, the way it's right now, I would um, let Kate be the first one, followed by Pia Yitha, I'm sorry, Pia Theta, uh, then Dan, and then followed by Bill. Great. So you can deselect your hand now. Okay, so um, uh, there's one more thing that I forgot to mention, that uh, when I am speaking, I'm going to actually lock the hotkey, and that will actually allow me to use my hand uh, for typing or um, other things, but then you will not be able to actually talk or, or enter text. All right, so let's do some introductions today. Um, First of all, what I'd like you to do, and you could probably do it, let's do it, and you actually can just type it as you see it here. Just put down your name, your department, or your, your unit, um, your experiences or knowledge of constructivism, and why you have joined us today. Uh, this is going to be interesting to see how this actually works out. Jason might have another um, method of doing this, but uh, if you would all at least enter your chat information, um, with those items, your name, department, experiences, and why you've joined us today. Okay, so far I've heard from Kate and Bill and Yasita. Um, maybe Michael is still typing. And 
Dan. Let's get into your text and then we can just kind of get an idea of where we're going here. Okay, one thing to realize also with a, a chat like this, there may be people who are actually um, part, they are participants, but they might not be actually wanting to say a whole lot. So you might not expect um, to get feedback from everybody at the same time. And there's Michael. Okay. All right. So take a, just a brief uh, minute here to kind of look at uh, what these people have responded. Um, you can scroll back up into the chat to see what people have um, actually said because the screen kind of moves down. You can move up to actually see what the, um, the responses were. Okay. All right. How I'd like to start the uh, presentation today is with an overview uh, in, in general. And when we teach in any way or use any particular method, we all really kind of work within this kind of learning cycle. And I'll talk about that in a second. Then we're going to talk about constructivism as a theory as a process and then as an instructional strategy. And then just briefly highlight some classroom applications. And then also the roles have, uh, have changed slightly within this particular paradigm uh, where the instructor is uh, taking a different role and the students actually take a different role as well. So that's our overview of today's workshop. <clears throat> okay, so what we have here is this learning cycle or the five E's. And even though you might not have heard of this or you've seen this particular kind of a model, but this is pretty typical of most teaching strategies where we have, you know, these five areas here. Um, at one point, the evaluate really wasn't part of the initial model, but evaluation really does and should occur at each stage of um, learning. So initially, we want to engage our audience. And we do this sometimes by um, beginning the, the presentation, um, maybe raising a question. Um, you could also put an image on the uh, screen or the a PowerPoint, just to kind of get people uh, prepared for what's going on. Uh, this is also a great opportunity for you to identify misconceptions in what students have actually maybe uh, brought to the learning situation. Um, typically, we don't know all of our students and we don't know exactly what kind of learning experiences they've had. But uh, during this engage uh, portion or, or section, it's a great time to get an idea of uh, what students have actually brought to the learning situation. Um, during this stage, we uh, have our students ask questions, you know, maybe why has something happened or how can I find out about a particular bit of information. Um, so again, ideas and examples for engaging your learners would be through um, maybe a story, something that has some sort of relevance to the topic, um, images always work really nice too. Even just looking at the image that you see here kind of gets people interested in, oh, wow, this is pretty neat. I've got some visuals here and I can keep going. All right, the next um, section or phase would be the exploration or the explore phase. Um, during this stage, students should pretty much be given opportunities to work together uh, in groups or, or pairs and really without a lot of direct instruction from or direction from the instructor. So you might give them a task to work on and say, okay, go ahead and, and do this. You, as the instructor, act as a facilitator. Uh, and at this point, you help your students frame questions by them asking questions and observing. And some students have difficulty with this because uh, some students don't even know how to maybe even approach a situation by asking a question. So you can kind of help them. Um, this is actually, as it states, it's an, it's an exploration phase. And the students at this point can be puzzled. They might not know how to actually approach the situation. So this is a great time for students to um, test um, hypotheses, um, predictions, um, try new forms of situations, try alternatives. And then you want them to discuss all of this uh, in their paired up group or in a, in a team um, so they can discuss uh, all these kind of situations and ideas they might have and they should also record observations and ideas and really suspend judgment of each other's um, uh, bits of information that they bring into that particular situation. Then we move on to the explain uh, phase. And this is where you have your students then explain the concepts in their own words. 
You know, it's very easy for us as faculty or instructors or TAs to actually provide information for our students. We want to kind of move along with the content, um, but you really want your students to be able to explain in their own words and then what you want to do is ask them for evidence and clarification of their, explana of their explanation. We want them to um, listen critically to one another's explanations. Uh, that you want them to listen to what you have to say. But again, you're kind of standing back a little bit here and providing some facilitation, but not actual um, instruction. Uh, the extend uh, is also sometimes called the uh, elaboration uh, phase. And this is when the students actually apply concepts and skills in new but similar situations and then provide some formal uh, definitions to what they have been discussing. You want to remind students of alternative explanations uh, to consider um, using different um, data, existing data, uh, and then all, <clears throat> pardon me, and then for them to provide the evidence that they have, had, have already explored in the previous three stages. Again, students will still ask questions at this particular stage. They should uh, propose solutions and make decisions. Um, and again, um, always recording observations. Now, the evaluation, as I mentioned, wasn't always part of the, the, this first cycle, though, but it has been added to create the five E's, and it should really take place throughout the entire learning experience. <clears throat> you should observe students' knowledge and skills, um, their application of new concepts, um, any change in thinking. Um, students should be able to also assess their own learning. Uh, by, them, uh, by allowing them to assess their own learning, it really makes them um, kind of be accountable for what they're um, actually doing. You should ask open-ended questions, um, look for answers that use observation and that evidence that they previously um, brought about through the, um, the four phases before. Um, so you really want to ask questions that would encourage their uh, investigation um, beyond what they're actually doing <clears throat> with that particular task. So you know, ask those questions that would encourage future uh, investigations. So that's just kind of an overview, uh, a quick one of uh, a learning cycle or the five E's. And as I was describing that, I'm sure you kind of figured out that you know that you have um, really included all of those phases or stages in your teaching, but you just probably didn't have an actual name for it. Not that, that you really have to name everything that you do, but uh, now you can actually kind of situate what you, you've done. So at this point, um, are there any questions, or does anybody want to say anything? And you can do that again um, through the microphone if you have one, or through the, the chat box at the bottom. So I'll give you um, maybe a minute here to kind of um, form a question that you might have, and then um, put them in there. Okay, um, Tia Sita, you asked, um, do we start with evaluation first? Well, actually, you really can't need to keep that in mind when you do begin, and you would, do, you would actually evaluate through the engaging part of it. Let's say you've um, developed some sort of an engaging uh, episode of your class and something doesn't go right or the students don't seem to be as engaged. Well, then you would actually make some changes. So yes, I would say that you use <coughs> evaluation at the very beginning and um, throughout all the other phases. So, because you've come to this workshop not knowing too much about uh, constructivism, but I imagine that you have heard about it through some readings or you've heard colleagues talk about it, how would you actually define constructivism? And again, I give you just a, a minute or so to form uh, uh, maybe a response. And if you would just enter that response in the chat area uh, at the bottom of the screen.
If you would prefer to verbalize your definition, um, you can raise your hand and uh, we'll let you talk to the rest of the class. Hey, Dan, go ahead. Uh, well, I'll take a shot at it. It's uh, how an individual understands or perceives the world, puts it together in his or her head. Okay, Dan, just to let you know that I can't hear you very well, is there a way maybe to turn up your volume? Okay, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try some out. I'm going to increase the volume and the volume control. I'll be with you in just a second. Okay, Tiasita, would you like to um, give a, a crack at, a, at defining constructivism? Okay, we see that uh, PCS is the way we build blocks of knowledge for students. That's part of it. And then Bill says, um, students and teachers jointly construct the course method and content. And yes, that is part of constructivism. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, here is one of many definitions out there of constructivism. And as this source says, fundamentally, constructivism says that people construct their own understanding and knowledge of the world through experiencing things and reflecting on those experiences. Um, it's probably not the best definition, but it was one of the shorter ones that I could find. But um, what it's really saying here is that when we encounter something new, such as knowledge or a task that we've been given, we have, to, we have to deal with it, and we deal with it based on the previous ideas and experiences we have brought to that particular situation. So the information that we have based on that new task or the new information we've been um, given, uh, we may change actually what we believe about our previous um, conceptions of, of uh, ideas, or we can actually discard the new information as irrelevant really depends, again, on what we bring to the learning situation. Uh, in general, though, we are active creators of our own knowledge. We, we, we take in information, we apply it to what we know. Um, again, we need to, so when we are active creators in our own knowledge, we do this, um, we must ask lots of questions. And that's key to a really excellent and um, strong constructivist classroom is the instructor asking really sound and intelligent and deep questions um, and then we explore more about the concept of the task, uh, and then we assess what we know. So that's kind of a, um, a general um, overview of what uh, constructive act, constructivism is, and I think I'll make it more clear with uh, more of the slides as we go through the presentation. So first of all, we're, I'm going to break the presentation down into the constructive Constructivism is a learning theory. As it's been mentioned in the definition, learning is an active process. Um, the more active we can be, the more hands-on, the more tangible, the more visual we make that instruction, the more we actually learn. So um, as this knowledge is constructed, we construct it as we think about it more and more and as we apply it to the information that we have brought in through our experience. Then learning is a personal interpretation of the world. So any encounter we have, whether it's a formal learning or informal learning, informal learning would be let's say walking along the sidewalk and reading something without any formal uh, structure. Um, but we interpret the, the world through our personal interpretation of what we see and what is brought to us in a learning situation. So ideally, constructivism is emphasizing these problem-solving and understanding types of situations. So we want to get our students to use active techniques to create more knowledge. And then um, a major part of constructivism is to have students reflect on what they've learned. And then not only just reflecting on it, but they should be talking about it with others. Um, 
So we have our students, you know, we bring the instructions to them, the new task, the new information, we have them reflect on it, we have them talk about what they're doing and how their understanding might be changing. Instructors then should make sure that they are familiar with the students' pre-existing conceptions about information, what they bring into the, the learning situation. And it may be difficult to do if you're teaching a class of 80 or 100 or more than that. It's obviously simpler with a smaller class, but with true instructional design, you really want to know who your learners are because by knowing them, you can actually structure the instruction that will be more meaningful for, for them. So through constant feedback and questioning, we are helping our students to understand these deeper problems. We want to use authentic, ta authentic tasks, experiences, settings, and assessments. So an authentic ta task could be uh, experiments, um, solving real-world problems. Uh, experiences that are authentic would be helping students learn how to learn um, by providing just enough information on a topic and then have your students maybe restate their questions. We prompt students to reflect on and examine their current knowledge. Um, authentic settings would be, let's say, laboratory work, field settings, but not just that, but even group work or paired work can be really an authentic setting for them to emphasize um, problem-solving tasks. And then authentic assessments, um, asking students about what they've learned. You know, we typically ask what students have learned through uh, the typical assessments of, of examinations. Um, but how many of us really actually ask our students what they have learned? Um, just personally, I mean, a question just like that. You know, what have you learned in this situation or with this particular um, task that you've been given? We want them to observe, personally observe what they have done. We want them to keep kind of a record of their process um, because sometimes really assessing the process can be even more meaningful than just assessing the outcome um, because we want to actually see growth in the students um, through the process of, of learning. Um, evaluation and assessments within a constructivist learning environment is more subjective than objective. Um, students should be able to make judgment calls themselves and to recognize um, what they might need to uh, revisit and then eventually revise. Um, when we talk about this holistic approach of uh, learning, we want to be able to provide information, um, kind of give them the big picture first, and then they deal with the smaller parts. Uh, so let's say if you have them create some sort of a project, um, it would be nice for them to see what the actual outcome actually looks like, and then to proceed into the smaller part uh, through various activities working toward the whole. So that's the, the idea of um, presenting information holistically. Before we begin this um, section, does anybody have any questions? Again, you can ask them. Um, if they have a question, you can uh, raise your hand. Um, Piacita, I think you wrote another question here. Uh, your question is, do smaller parts help avoid the information overload? Yes, they would. Um, but sometimes if we don't present the, the entire uh, situation or task, they might not see the, you know, you really need to, need to see the whole before you actually see um, the smaller parts. Um, think about, let's say, um, if you buy a piece of furniture from Ikea and you get it home and you want to put it together and there's a gazillion parts to put this, maybe let's call it a, a, a bookshelf together. And you, what you do, though, you keep looking at the finished image as you're actually putting together those smaller parts um, even though those parts are all important and they become part of the whole, you keep referring to the larger image to make sure that you're kind of making um, making that uh, bookshelf look the way it actually should. So yes, um, smaller parts uh, do help information overload. Um, we're not really going to talk about overload, but um, I think that analogy does help with that. Okay, constructivism is also, in addition to being a theory, it's also a process. And I've broken the next couple of slides into uh, a process for the instructor as well as a process for the, the, the students. Ideally, you want to adapt your curriculum to address your students' suppositions and their needs. 
Um, and you're going to go, oh my gosh, I can't do this for every single student I have, otherwise I'd have several different um, curricula to deal with. Well, I'm not saying that you would have to do that completely, but you, what you do is that you want to provide um, uh, instruction, um, which is dealing with the critical aspect of knowing your students. Okay. So first of all, find out maybe what they bring um, to the class, what are their conceptions or their misconceptions. Uh, you can do that with a type of um, pre-class survey to find out if they have knowledge that will be necessary for them to be successful in your class. Have they taken a prerequisite course? Do they have prerequisite knowledge? Um, this, this concept about uh, negotiating goals and objectives with the learners. Once you get to know who your students are, that will help you then be able to negotiate, uh, especially the objectives, based on the learners and what they bring to the, the situation. Um, posing problems right here of emerging relevance to students. This is really very important. Many students complain that the information that they're learning, they say, you know, what do we have to learn this for? This doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't have any relevance. So uh, in a constructivist learning situation, it's, it's nice to be able to pose problems that they're working on that has some relevance to them. Um, it would have some relevance to what they bring into the situation, or and obviously would have relevance to what they are going to be doing once they um, leave your program and, and go out in the work world. Ideally, if you can provide hands-on, real-world experiences, that would be great. Um, sometimes that's not all, always possible, but again, the more realistic these experiences you provide for your students in, in these classrooms, um, it will help make them understand concepts, even more difficult concepts, a little bit um, more so than just um, kind of cruising on without giving them any kind of experiences or ideas or uh, examples, um, but again, uh, Learning does occur uh, <clears throat> not in a more high-end way, but if a student is able actually to handle something, touch something, do some sort of hands-on experience, uh, learning can be more meaningful for them. Ideally, we would like to make sure our students are comfortable speaking, especially their points of view about certain situations. So we want to make sure we provide a classroom that is uh, open, um, for students to be able to um, say things without being uh, laughed at or reprimanded or whatever. So we want to make a very open environment for our learners. And then this last point is kind of important too, the social context of content. And what I'm saying there, I think I can best use it through a type of uh, analogy too, where let's say you're teaching math, um, one of my weaker subjects, but the difference between teaching uh, folk or street math versus school or book math. That will again lead back to those real world type of um, situations where that math might be more meaningful if you can provide it uh, with situations that they would actually be using once they leave um, a particular situation. Okay, a couple other points here about constructivism as a process with the instructor. We want to provide uh, different ways of um, representing our content in our class. So providing these multiple uh, flexible approaches uh, to learning that will hopefully result in success for all the diverse learners that you have. Um, so if you can teach in multiple modalities, um, that will help increase access for any struggling students and hopefully will provide um, learning for all the learners. If you can make uh, different choices in the way you present information uh, using multiple formats, um, such as even using different colors for highlighting information, um, different headings for main ideas, uh, if you can provide maybe uh, multiple examples and non-examples of content. Uh, some examples, let's say, <clears throat> Uh, of conflict or arguments in war. Okay, so a non-example of a conflict uh, would include cooperating to solve a problem and working together uh, to help someone. So if you can provide ways, you know, different ways of presenting the information, um, hopefully it will attract um, uh, the learners that have the different kinds of styles and, and uh, needs for, for learning. So in general, multiple modes uh, will support learners' background knowledge, what they bring in. 
Ideally, you will be coaching and moderating and suggesting in your class. Uh, we'll talk about roles a little bit later in this presentation, but um, try to help your students understand information by coaching them, you know, instead of just spewing out information and being the, um, the, the sage on the stage. You want to be, as they say, the guide on the side. Testing or assessment should be integrated with the task. You don't want it to make a completely separate activity that is not related to the content. Um, so you really, uh, as we did in the very beginning, we looked at an evaluation all the way through the process of learning. Every task you have, every um, activity that you have your students working on should be assessed to see if it actually is meaningful for them and if they've actually learned anything. And what you can do then from those assessments, if you find errors um, that your students um, have encountered, those errors are actually going to inform your students of how they're doing. And instead of just giving them some feedback saying that you got this wrong or you got this right, ask your students to assess themselves on their errors. You know, why do you think you didn't get this? Why do you think you answered incorrectly? Um, so then they can go back to their prior knowledge and the new knowledge they're learning um, to see if their understanding has changed um, in any particular ideas. So I, I would recommend trying to get your students to be more a part of the assessment process by having them um, assess their own progress, um, and if they get things wrong, to fire, you know, make you know, make them responsible for figuring out why they got it wrong. Okay, um, are there any questions before we start the constructivism as a process uh, for the student? If you have a um, question or you'd like to make a comment, um, you can raise your hand or you can type in a response in the chat box. Okay, all right. Then moving on to constructivism as a process for the student. Um, the student really is actually taking a major role in their, their own learning in a, in a constructivist environment. They can help develop their um, own goal, the actually class goals and, and um, assessments or objectives actually. Um, and this is done very, um, not easily, but it's, it's made more um, simple by trying to get some pre-assessment data from finding out who your students are and then developing those goals and assessments according to what they, they have brought into this learning situation. Okay, the students also create these new understandings through the coaching that you're providing, through the moderating, through the questioning that you're asking, and so on. And then students also have a major control of their, of their own learning through reflection. And reflection can be done in various ways. And I'm going to ask you, how do you think you could actually um, elicit reflection from your students? What techniques, what tools, what ways do you think that you could actually get some um, reflection going on from your students. So I'll um, allow you to um, type their, your information in the chat area, give you about a, a minute here to respond. So list ways do you think that we can get students to reflect on their own learning? What tools could they use? Great, I see uh, journaling, blogs, discussion boards, short essays, discussion, questions answered. Great, great responses, helping other students learn. Peer working, excellent. Kate, I have a question for you. You mentioned the three minute reflection papers at the end of a lecture. Do you actually do that in your teaching right now? Maybe while Kate is typing a response, I see, um, did um, Sally, did you have a question? Okay. 
Kate, I'm going to ask you again, I don't know if you're still typing, but um, have you used the three-minute reflection paper in your own teaching? Okay, I'll, I'll move along here and maybe we'll get back to Kate in, in a second. Um, <clears throat> In the second slide, talking about the students, uh, we want the students to feel that they're part of a community of learners. And we don't want them to be considered isolated students, students, just a Z number of students sitting in your class. We want them to become members of this community of learners. And the more we can stress and emphasize the importance of that, I think the more motivated your students will actually be. Collaborating among fellow students. Uh, this is really important, and, and we don't want to just do it for the sake of sticking them in a group. It's because we want them to uh, review the chapter readings. We really want them to truly collaborate amongst themselves. You know, what can someone um, provide uh, to the situation, and how can someone actually assist in that? Okay, I see a comment from Jason. Uh, in the online courses I teach, I ask students to clear and unclear windows statement at the end of each module. Where they can reflect on what is clear then at the end of the unit, what is still unclear to them. Great. It's like a three-minute paper. Thank you, Jason. That was great. Great information. And by the way, we are archiving this presentation, so all the chat uh, dialogue will be archived for your access at a later time. Okay. Also, we want to realize that students are learning in a social experience. Okay. And, and what we're saying here is that we want the students and the faculty to appreciate differences in perspectives. Uh, everyone brings in a different perspective, um, different points of view, um, different learning styles, um, different educational levels. So we need to make sure that everyone feels um, very comfortable in, in bringing in um, really who they are and being able to express themselves. And also our students need to be taking ownership you know, really, the, the grades that students receive are based on their, um, what they're actually doing in class. Okay. So we need for them to be responsible and take ownership of their own learning, to have a voice in the learning process. Our research has shown, especially from the constructivist point of view, that if a student has a voice in the learning process, if they're able to help develop goals and objectives, if they're able to uh, make suggestions on how the class is going. Uh, they're much more motivated and they learn more in that class than if they were in maybe a class that didn't support that type of um, process. Okay, what you see here is uh, kind of a comparison between a traditional classroom and a constructivist classroom, uh, the left-hand side. And this is just kind of things that are actually going on, what actually makes up um, a class. So again, what are the, the key points in constructivism that you see on the right-hand side? We're trying to begin with the whole and expanding to the parts. Well, this definitely can be uh, applicable to a project, but it also can be um, related to concepts and constructs. Uh, notice on the third section down here, uh, in a traditional classroom, you know, students purchase textbooks, we get them workbooks, worksheets. In a constructivist classroom, on the other hand, instead of giving them a textbook that is made up of, of secondary sources, we can deal with like the primary sources, original documents. We want them to be able to manipulate materials and so on. So I'm not going to read through each of these points in here, um, but it's a good way to kind of give you an idea of uh, things that go on, the components of uh, one class um, uh, situation than another. Uh, Obviously, in a traditional classroom, students tend to work more individually than students working in groups in a constructivist situation sort of set up. So it's just kind of a, an idea of what um, some of the similarities and differences are within these two modes of instruction. All right, so as we probably surmise now, um, constructive and Constructivism is a strategy. It is an approach to teaching and a way that we can actually get students truly interested in um, becoming lifelong learners. So 
what we're talking about is also not only do we want our students to collaborate, but we want our instructors to be able to collaborate also. And if we can show this happening in front of our students, they, they will actually see the relevance of, of working in groups, of working in teams, and becoming collaborators together. We want to really provide um, a very challenging, authentic, and multidisciplinary learning environment for our students. Um, tailoring to the needs and the purposes of the individual learners, again, as I mentioned before, it may not be possible for you to provide learning situations that will uh, embrace every learning style, every student out there as individuals, but the more you can bring that type of instruction in, uh, the better your students are going to be taking in the information. So we want to provide an open learning environment. We want students to take control of their learning. We don't want them to be spoon-fed and lectured to. We want them to take an active part in their learning. We want to challenge them, and challenging is key. You know, provide your students with just enough information about a particular situation or a task then see if they can take it a little bit further. We want them to be able to kind of stretch their thinking about a particular situation. Um, we want the learning situation to be authentic, you know, pose problems that are relevant to the students. And multidisciplinary, if we can provide um, information by bringing in different ideas or themes that emerge across um, various content areas. Um, can be quite useful for your students to see that, yes, um, you might be studying one particular subject, but you know, it definitely has a relationship to others that you're uh, working with and taking in your, uh, your stay here at the university. As you have probably um, surmised by now, um, constructivism can help students um, pursue, the, pursue their interests and their own purposes of being there. Um, some students just don't really get it right away of why they're even in school until they hit some of those major classes. Um, but if we can provide constructivism even in their uh, first and second year classes, uh, I think they'll be more inclined to do even better in their third and fourth year classes. Uh, constructivism helps students also um, use their abilities that they've brought into a particular learning situation and then develop those based on the challenges that you provide for them. And ideally, I guess probably the, the most important aspect, I would believe, of constructivism is to develop students' interest in lifelong learning. Um, I think it's maybe a passe as far as a, a term, um, but it's so important that students really have a desire to learn more, ask more questions after they've learned something. Uh, once they start to ask questions beyond um, the task, uh, you've known, you know at that point that you've made a, a difference in their life that they actually want to learn a little bit more about something. Okay, constructivism also will encourage us as instructors um, to, uh, again, match or somehow um, attract a student's learning style. We should also be able to understand a student's rate of learning. You know, all of our students don't learn the same way. And uh, if we can understand where they're coming from and how they learn, um, so much the better. We also want them to make sure that they are uh, comfortable in interacting with others. Uh, this can be difficult for some students. I had a student one semester who said she didn't want to work in a group. And I said, well, part of this class required them to work in a group. And she balked and I said she had to stay and it turns out that she kind of sabotaged the group the rest of the semester and I found that out too late. But um, we want to make sure that students are comfortable interacting with others um, so they can learn from them, they can gain from them, um, and they can just become better learners themselves. Okay, so actually applying constructivism in the classroom, uh, we've covered a lot of this already through some of the theoretical standpoints, but we want to make sure that we have problems um, that make sense to their lives uh, or their careers or their aspirations. Um, so let's say, for example, if you're teaching music appreciation, uh, you could provide examples of classical and other music genres related to popular music. There's a lot of popular music out there that has that has their um, 
Genesis in the older classical pieces. And if you can show that relationship, you might have students appreciate music even more. Relevance to the information doesn't have to be pre-existing. They don't have to have, they don't really have to see that, they don't typically come into the classroom having these preconceived notions of relevance. Okay. But you as the instructor can help kind of mediate um, that relevance by providing examples and situations that would be more meaningful for them. Um, again, in the classroom, you want to help students make meaning about maybe more complex issues or concepts by breaking those holes into the parts. But they have to see the hole first. So avoid starting with the parts to build the hole. So for example, let's say <clears throat> in an environmental biology class, um, you can help students uh, build their knowledge or construct their own knowledge about the birds and the bees, you know, the flora and the fauna as they relate to one another in the rainforest. Then after the students view a video on the rainforest, um, you can provide facts about plant life that can make more sense to them in the context of the, um, the little habitats and micro habitats um, that they observed in the video. Uh, applying big ideas to various subject areas, you know, conceptual themes that emerge across various content areas, such as, uh, let's say, you have a, you want to teach students about um, world literature, if you're an English teacher. Well, you can kind of span, you know, move out of the typical world of English by going into culture uh, or cultural diversity through world literature. Let's say you're teaching social studies, um, maybe the internet and the spread of cultural values. Obviously, you're talking about technology with the internet, talking about society uh, with that um, topic, and then also you're talking about science. Let's say you're talking about media studies. Uh, you want students to be learning about people in other countries. Obviously, you could be talking further about environments, so you, know, you could span leaving uh, media studies and going into biology, and geology, um, anthropology with people and places. Um, another example would be, let's say, science. We're talking about genetics. You know, what what um, uh, conceptual themes might emerge from that? Um, genetics deals with time, obviously, uh, continuity of uh, genes, and obviously change. Again, possibly affected by environmental factors. So you can see a span of, of topics that could be covered through these uh, conceptual themes. So what we want to do, you know, again, challenging these ideas, having students seek more information um, <clears throat> through elaboration. Now, a lot of students don't like to or can't or don't know how to elaborate on ideas. So it's up to us as instructors to be able to work with them. If they have a question or if they, let's say, maybe they answer something and the answer is pretty short and, and sweet, let's say we want to say, you know, can you elaborate more on that? And if they don't know how to elaborate, maybe you could just show an example of how to elaborate. Because we don't want our students just to give these really quick, short answers, but we really want them to think deeply about uh, providing information and to um, make them um, become more um, deeper thinkers, uh, dealing with problem solving and so on. Okay, applying uh, constructivism in the classroom, we've already discussed the this concept about adapting um, to students um, kind of worldview and what they bring into teaching. You know, what you could do is you could have students pre um, present um, developmentally appropriate work, a work that would be uh, good for one student might not be quite for another. See if you can provide assignments that might be able to span a little bit of the different types of learning uh, abilities or capabilities of your other students. Have your students maybe prepare projects in formats. Uh, that might challenge and engage them rather than, uh, you know, rehash projects they've already done in previous semesters. Uh, role play can be very useful in presenting information and ideas. Um, sometimes, you know, we've had our students get up and do a presentation on chapter readings. Maybe have them do a role play instead of, of a chapter reading. It would make them think more deeply about what they've actually learned. All along, again, we need to assess what's going on, so we as instructors should monitor our students um, perceptions and ways of learning while they're actually engaged in the work that they're doing or the tasks that we have them doing. Uh, so an example of that would be, let's say, um, preparing, you know, your students preparing for a presentation of um, 
uh, a big issue right now, the polar ice cap melting and polar bear migration. You, know, you can provide a videotape showing polar bear migration uh, or the ice actually melting. You could uh, merge and integrate um, the readings from the textbook, uh, popular media readings. Uh, students could uh, interview Native people, or they could go online and chat with Native people. Uh, so then the, finally they could just kind of roll that all into a discussion in groups followed by uh, a really nice presentation using all kinds of technology and, and things. So that would be a way of providing all kinds of um, opportunities for students with different skill levels uh, to be part of the kind of equation of putting the whole thing together. Um, some of the research talks about removing uh, the bell curve assessment that's very typical of um, college uh, grading or assessment. And if you let your students know that up front, it's going to kind of free them from the need that they have to outdo somebody else. Uh, you know, we have lots of overachievers, we have underachievers, and we have a lot of students in between. Um, but you're really better off allowing them to kind of collaborate uh, on something um, rather than um, always competing with someone, especially if you have to have X amount of A's, X amount of F's, and you know, a whole bunch of um, C's in, in the middle. So authentic assessment is really uh, more meaningful and um, uh, last, because, well, I'll rephrase that. Uh, the assessment that occurs and that last is um, more meaningful when it relates to those concerns that the students actually have, the concerns that they, are, they actually face. So students who assess um, efforts, let's say, um, you could have them work to pass, let's say, a, a bill in a mock legislature meeting, they're likely to demonstrate greater mastery of that, of government, than those who might just uh, be assessed by using a multiple choice test on um, you know, the legislature and uh, things that are going on with that, maybe multiple choice questions on the legislative branch of, of Congress. So keep your uh, test, your short answer test and your multiple choice test, you know, rather than do you know this material to authentic, authentic tasks that might be what do you know? It's very easy for us to say, okay, do you know? It's easy to, for them to study and regurgitate the information in a multiple choice um, test much more difficult for them to actually have them explain what do you know. Um, it does take a lot longer to grade those kinds of exams, um, but in constructivist uh, environments, uh, it's more meaningful for students to actually uh, say what they know rather than just kind of regurgitate that information of do you know, yes or no. We're not really talking um, specifically about online um, constructivism situations, but I thought I would put this information in here just because we are um, trying this uh, workshop online. But um, when you want to implement constructivism in an online setting, again, you can use a lot of the, uh, the components that we have just, or the characteristics that we've just spoken about. Um, we need to, again, consider students as being individuals. We want them to maybe even choose particular tasks that might be appropriate for them. Maybe they can negotiate different types of report titles based on um, a concept or a content. Um, tasks within the internet, students can actually create web pages, concept maps. Uh, if you need to learn more about concept maps, I can provide information for you on that. Uh, videos often replace lectures. And I'm not saying that all lectures have to be completely replaced by videos, but there are different ways of presenting information online than they are in a traditional uh, classroom. Um, exams could be replaced by reports on particular issues or through internet resources. Students can um, do these types of uh, uh, research uh, projects rather than just doing plain old exams. Now, Dan Cabrera, I think you're still with us. Um, I know that you teach online and I've not taught online, so maybe you could uh, even discuss or maybe uh, remark on some of these comments here. Um, also working in pairs or groups and Blackboard does support that. So if you do start to consider blended learning or online learning, uh, you can do it with a constructivist kind of standpoint. But you just need to think about it a little bit more. So Dan, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, can you make any comments about possibly what you've just learned about constructivism and how it might um, 
fit in an online setting such as the course that you teach? Well, I think I may have done this in the past already uh, by replacing... Sorry, Dan. Finally. Dan, we can't hear you very well. Can you put your speaker up a little bit? Okay, Dan, go ahead. I guess at least everyone can hear you all right. Well, thank you, Janet. Uh, I was saying that I think I've already done some of that in previous classes. I, I used to have a midterm and a final examination, and I replaced the final examination by having a uh, an activity that involves uh, collaborative effort, uh, a group activity or a team activity, in which the students are really asked to apply some of the principles of um, ethical decision making. So rather than just having uh, an, an exam that, that you know seeks to um, uh, elicit information uh, in a true-false or multiple-choice format or even an essay, this actually involves having them work in, uh, in groups for an extended period of time, uh, repeated interaction, some of which occurs in a um, WIMBA-like environment like this. In fact, they have their own WIMBA classroom. Um, an exchange, and um, and then finally having uh, a um, having one representative make the presentation, uh, trying to represent the uh, various components that each person contributed. Um, that's what I'm doing now, and that's always uh, that, that's in an online environment. Thank you, Dan. That was very useful, and that gave you an idea of how you could use a Windows supported class, such as what we're doing right now in your own teaching. You know, you being the instructor could provide the bulk of the information, but you could definitely have your students provide lots of content, either in written form or um, as an audio, as we've just heard. So we get to this part in our presentation that kind of compares the differences between the student um, and the instructor, and you know how the the roles have actually changed or, or what it what it can actually um how it can affect the, the learner and the, the instructor. So you know look through the, the two columns here and you're going to see that the instructor definitely is a facilitator of knowledge. So instead of you being, I mean yes you are the expert, but you're perceived more as a facilitator. You're you're perceived as a co learner, as a collaborator. And um you know the student uh, attributes are also um, very similar to the instructor. Uh, notice that, that the instructor is a team member as well as the student being a team member. Uh, the instructor can also be an information receiver as well as the student being an information receiver. Uh, many faculty who teach in a constructivist type of uh, uh, mode say that they learn as much from the students as the students learn from them. And if you start off the semester with that kind of a um, a presentation style, and your students know that, uh, it would actually kind of relax, I think, some of the hesitancy some students might have um, just on the part of um, being a student versus a faculty member. So I'm not going to go through each of these, these uh, points here, but um, you can see that the, the role is, is somewhat changing here, where the, um, the, the student is learning through discovery. Uh, the student is a negotiator of knowledge, and what that means is that you know, our, our students and we as even faculty have our preconceived notions about certain types of information and some of it might be misconceptions. So if someone has a misconception about something and they're willing to discuss it, or as I should say they have a conception of something and they discuss it with a, another student, that student might be able to turn the information around and the other student realize that, hmm, maybe the information wasn't the way I thought it should be and I've just learned from my, my peer. So. Students are reflective learners, they're knowledge creators, they create their own knowledge based on the way you present information as a faculty member. Um, and you know, one of the keys to uh, constructivism is the uh, concept of active learning and being a responsible learner. So quickly, um, as far as uh, uh, a summary, uh, we noticed that the uh, shift of emphasis from teaching to learning. 
um, this is all happening in this particular type of a situation. We as faculty should be able to individualize and contextualize students' learning experiences. We want to help our students develop processes and skills and attitudes. We should also reflect, make sure that we um, give students credit for process, for learning, for growing, and for developing throughout our class rather than just assessing particular outcomes. Constructivism also considers students' learning styles. Um, the focus is on students constructing their own knowledge, not just reproducing information. We would like to make sure that we use authentic tasks to fully engage our students. And again, tasks not just like having students report on chapter readings. I know I kind of beat a dead horse on this one a little bit, but um, uh, faculty often have students report on chapter readings. You know, that gets a little bit old. Let's get, give them some authentic tasks to really engage them and motivate them. Um, Problem-based thinking really is a major component of constructivism, uh, which provides that kind of meaningful, deep learning. Um, negotiation of meaning, again, as I've just discussed, people come in with preconceptions of information, and maybe we need to reconsider some of that based on dialogue. Um, we want to also have our students reflect on um, prior and new knowledge, and very important to constructivism is getting our students to extend beyond content that's presented to them. But once they've learned the task, how can you get them to be able to be intrigued and motivated enough to go a little bit beyond that uh, and become more lifelong learners? I probably didn't think this was going to happen, but you're going to take a quiz. Um, and don't worry about it. Uh, there's really no true right or wrong answers, uh, but I wanted you to get a feel for what a quiz would be like in this kind of a learning situation. So I have one, two, three, four, five questions, and I have to uh, put them up one at a time in this particular situation. Um, but before we do that, because I know some people might have to leave a little bit early, uh, I also want to show you that you can show video and audio uh, on within this particular situation. So, for example, I'm going to bring up uh, a website that um, shows a, a simulation. And simulations are extremely useful in constructive as learning environments. So I'm going to bring it up and um, we'll let you see what, um, what it's all about. Okay, this comes up within the, the, the screen of, of, of Wimba, and um, this is actually one that I just kind of stumbled across one time, but I really liked it because it was a very well done simulation. It gives um, the option of seeing animation, and the animation can either be through a step through process or it can be narrated. So, what's nice about this, let's say you have a hearing impaired student that might not be able to hear the narration, well, they have the option of seeing a step through process, and the same information is going to be presented but it's going to be um, presented in different modes. Let's say you have a visually impaired student, then they can be, um, take advantage of the narrated section uh, or component of this animation. So I'm going to choose the, the narrated one first. I'm going to press play. Okay, so you get an idea. That's the, the narration or the um, uh, the audio. Now, notice that there is no text that goes along with it. Uh, research has shown that if you do this type of uh, uh, simulation and you have images and then you have uh, audio track, there really doesn't need to be a need for the, 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 the text um, if you give the students an option of just having text alone. So the step-through process looks like this. Notice it has the, the text generated, but there will not be any narration. So the student can read along and watch the animation that way. And they have an option of also taking a quiz. 
and that's always really good feedback uh, for something like this. Another one here is called um, Virtual Frog Dissection Kit. I don't, don't mean to gross anybody out here, but I thought it was pretty clever. Um, there are a lot of schools that are going to virtual dissection versus using the real thing um, because of ethical purposes. Notice each of these little areas are um, checked. So everything that's checked is what you see. And then as you begin to peel off layers, and it's kind of a bad analogy, I guess, but if we're going to remove the skin, we're left with all of the others. And then this shows, you know, just it's kind of a virtual way of, of dissecting. So you, know, you want to remove the heart. You kind of click and re-click to see where the heart is. Same thing with the stomach click and re-click to see where that is and so on. Again, just some uh, nice ways of providing visual information in this particular kind of learning um, uh, structure. Um, there are other sources that I made available. I'm not going to go through those right now, but there are a lot of uh, websites available that are related to constructivism that you might find useful. But I'm going to take you back to the test. But before we do that, I'd like to ask if anyone has any questions. That's, um, before, um, before I give you the test, which is really the end of the presentation, um, I'd like to ask if anyone has any questions about what we've covered, any resources, um, or anything in general about constructivism or maybe even WIMBA. So I'll give you a moment or two to formulate your uh, responses, and then you can type them directly into the, the chat window. If you're typing something, maybe you could put a check mark by your name so I know that you're actually going to be submitting something. No questions. Okay, great. Well, then we'll take the test. Here's your first test. Uh, you have a, our first question or response, and then you type your response in the please respond and click submit in this little window. Um, that you see directly below the question. While you're um, responding, Jason, if I could ask you, how long would you actually let students take to uh, complete a question like this? Um, I, I would say anywhere, you know, I'm within a minute, I would think they could come up with a, a quick response um, to that. So I, I wouldn't definitely wouldn't drag on longer than that, but. Um, that and I think it depends too on um, if it's a if you're asking them to elaborate or as you you've asked just you know two quick ideas they can definitely type that within a minute. Thank you, Jason. Okay, I'm going to assume that some of you have written your responses and and you've submitted it. Um, I have the option of previewing your responses before I actually publish them. So I am going to, if I do this right, I'm going to um, preview and publish. So just give me about a couple seconds here. Great. Okay, here we have um, some responses. And again, notice uh, we chose not to include your names. So this allows students to have a voice in the, in the class because Sometimes the responses, if they know they're going to be posted with a name and they might have the wrong uh, response, they would be quite embarrassed. So um, choosing not to include their name is really a good idea. Let me give you one more question.
Okay, I just realized that I can see a response rate um, as people are submitting their responses. Uh, so right now we have six, seven responses at 88%. I'm going to preview the results and then I'm going to publish them. And thank goodness everybody got that one right. It was pretty obvious of that. But it does show you, you can have different types of questions um, within this particular format that you just kind of plug in the information and it's uh, formatted for you. So 100%, uh, congratulations, you all did quite well. All right, well, um, that about wraps it up. We're about uh, 10 minutes before the hour. I wanted to leave a little time if anyone had any questions or comments, but I appreciate your uh, taking the time to uh, walk through or sit through uh, my first online uh, effective workshop. Um, so I see some clapping going on here. Uh, notice over by your name, you have a little smiley face. Uh, that is one way that you can actually um, Without typing and clapping, you can um, do that. I do see a question uh, from Dan. Dan, would you like to uh, ask a question? Yes, uh, well, actually more of a comment. Oh, man, I guess it's a question. Were you going to make this available, uh, this uh, session, as an archive session for everyone to have access to? Okay, I didn't hear your question quite well, but I think did you ask if uh, I'm going to make this available? Um, but yes, this will be available uh, to faculty on our FACTEV website. Thank you very much. And as you can see, Jason says later this afternoon. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, I hope you have uh, picked up a little bit of uh, information about constructivism. Uh, maybe you can either continue to include it in your teaching or maybe um, adapt or uh, integrate some of it in your teaching uh, from this point on. Um, I uh, was glad to provide this for you together, and I thank my colleagues, uh, Jason Rohde and Olga Irvin, for helping me put all this. Um, it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it, but it does take a little bit of um, learning. But um, thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, hope to see you at another FactDev website or uh, FactDev workshop real soon. Bye-bye.